this week on the Roommates Podcast. But I feel for sisters, man. Mm-hmm. Because they now the numbers say only 28%, I believe, of black women are expected to get married. 28? 28%. And we got to look at ourselves as black men. I'm not saying you can't marry outside of the race, you know, anything like that. But I do have a problem if you put women who are non-black, if you're black and you put non-black women on a pedestal, like if you think white women, Asian women, Hispanic women, Indian women, whatever, are better than black women, that's a problem. And I do have a problem with that. Yo, what's good, world? It's your boy, Hafiz. Chris, the star of the show, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And welcome to The Roommates, a worldwide community of individuals united on the values of becoming holistic health, kindness, togetherness, and a thirst for knowledge. Also. Also known as the best hour of your week where you are. Entertain like a stand-up. Educate like a TED Talk, and. Enlighten like a sermon, baby. Yo, yo, yo. We are back in. What? In what? What do you mean, what? Where are we at? Oh, in Los Angeles? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> I didn't know what you was talking about. Hey, my bad, my bad. Man, what happened? I'll space that for a second. Oh, Relax, man. Bro. So uh, we're back in Los Angeles, California. I love LA. I love LA. You know, I thought I would hate LA. Yeah. But then I, I just go and I see the mountains and the trees. And I'm like, yo, how can you not be happy there? Yeah, well, I won't be happy because no parking. No parking <laughs> it's ridiculous around here. But, Gas, four dollars. <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. Bump the mountain. <laughs> but, you know, we're back as usual, and we got somebody that I am very, very, very excited. Been yes, following yes. his story for quite a long time, and yes. he's one of the people that I've heard about his character before I heard about his profession. Mm, mm, mm. Um, my Shout out to Uncle Show. He's the first person that taught me that from his own life that a man isn't judged by the accolades that he's gained, yep. but by the character that he's developed. And this man who's coming on the show is somebody who has such amazing character. Some Everybody I know speaks such rave reviews about yep. him. Yep. He's always uplifting, encouraging people. And I'm just I'm just so blessed to have him on the show. Amen. The one, the only Mr. Chris Broussard. <laughs> yes, Welcome no, to the what's show. What's happening, fellas? Yo. Y'all got a nice little flow there. Like, yeah, do y'all rhyme? We're professional. Y'all MCs. Whoa, whoa, that's all right. Y'all had the little run DMC <laughs> like back and forth and all that stuff. No, no, no. They're not ready for my music. My music. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, for our audience who don't, who don't know you are, can you give a bit of an elevator pitch synopsis about who you are, all you do, and all that jazz? Well, as far as my job, I'm uh, what most people know me from is I'm an NBA analyst at Fox Sports. And not now not just an NBA analyst, actually a sports broadcaster, a broadcaster at Fox Sports. I have a national radio show called The Odd Couple. Uh, it's on Monday through Friday, yep. 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern time, 4 to 7 Pacific. Uh, and I do television. I'm on all the different Fox Sports One sports shows, yep. debate shows, uh, giving my opinion, my analysis on sports, mainly the NBA, but also NFL gotcha. and and on the radio, all sports. Uh, I worked, a lot of people know me because I worked at ESPN for 12 years mm-hmm. from 2004 to 2016, uh, covering the NBA, was an NBA insider, reporter, did sideline reporting. Uh, so career-wise, that's kind of I've been covering the NBA for over 25 years. Mm. Uh, off of that, I'm also uh, the founder of a men's national men's ministry called the King Movement, mm-hmm. which is an acronym that stands for Knowledge, Inspiration, and Nurture Through God. Mm. So that's that's something that I do a lot in my spare time. And then I'm married. I've been married 23 years. Oh wow! Almost 24. And uh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I have twin daughters who are 21. Oh, wow. I just turned 21 I this week. I want twins, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my wife used to say when we were dating that she wanted twins. I really didn't want twins. Yeah. I, it wasn't anything against it, but I just was like, no, nah, I don't really want it. And uh, then when we found out we were pregnant with twins, she was just shocked and scared. Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, this is great. And all that. So be careful what you <laughs> say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on two get some twins. evil boys. <laughs> yes, no. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, one of the things that I feel like a lot of people don't know about you is just, um, I mean, so most some people do. I would argue most people who just know you from the sports aspect don't know just uh, how much you give back to the community, yep. especially to young men and how much uh, faith is it intricate part of your life so 
I guess our one of the things we were trying to figure out is like, what is your story? Like, what is your um, testimony, so to speak? Like, mm-hmm. how did you, how did faith and Christianity and Christ and all that stuff become such an important part of your life? Well, I was raised uh, Catholic, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family is Creole from Louisiana. Shout out, shout out Louisiana. Black yeah, and yeah. French. Yeah. Creole yeah. too. African and French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we raised Catholic. Yep. And my father actually went to seminary in high school for a few years to be a priest. Oh, he wow. studied to be a Catholic priest. So I'm glad he didn't mm. because I, they celibate. So I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but uh, that's I real deal. Yeah. <laughs> but he, uh, so he, this was in the late 50s. He was in seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm. and he experienced some racism there. Mm. And uh, he was talking with his dad. He was just really discouraged about it. And his dad told him, he said, everybody's not meant to be Jackie Robinson. Mm. So come on, son. Yeah. You know, and so That's the rest deep. is history. He didn't become a priest. So I was raised Catholic, went to church every Sunday, went to Catholic schools from second grade through high school. Mm. So I learned a lot about the teachings of Jesus and, you know, we had religion classes every year. Uh, but in Catholicism, you're not really taught much about the personal relationship. That's real. And I ain't know anything about a personal relationship. Uh, about a lot didn't about read saints. the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, learned about saints. I went to, I and we went learned, to learned a lot of good well. stuff. Yeah, we yeah. learned the Ten Commandments and yeah. a lot of morality and all that. Yeah. But... Um, I didn't know anything. I never read the Bible, mm. you know, uh, on my own. We have religion books and Bible stories. I did know a lot of Bible stories. I probably knew more Bible stories than the, the typical Protestant, mm. you know, because you do learn, you know, learn about the apostles and the Beatitudes mm. and, you know, Jesus separating the sheep and the goat and, you know, all that is goats and all that stuff. So I had that background, but I wasn't living it. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't, didn't have a personal relationship with Christ. And it showed in my lifestyle. Just, you know, typical kid getting drunk, getting involved in sexual immorality, uh, pledge fraternity, hazing, pledge, fraternity pledges and stuff like that. Are you in a fraternity? I'm a Kappa. Oh, a Kappa. Okay. don't look at me. <laughs> were you a Q? No, I'm not. I'm not. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I am. Oh. I am. I am. I am a brother. Are you, are, you, are you in a fraternity? No, I said, but if I was to play If anything, I was. <laughs> I played football, so I didn't we didn't have enough time. I ain't going to lie to okay. you. Okay. Yeah. I did it for personal reasons. I knew I would have You did crazy. pledge? No, I said oh. I would have went crazy if I did pledge. Like, oh, sexual what morality. would you have pledged? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what about you? I would have pledged Kappa. My, my, one of my best friends is a Kappa. Okay. Yeah, so I would have I would have pledged Kappa. But yeah. it depends on my group of friends, what we want to do. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, my father was a Kappa, oh, so yeah. that's why I pledged Kappa. Yeah. That really was I didn't know that much about him. Oh. But gotcha. just because he did, and then when I was, I played basketball in college. What school did you go to? Oberlin College uh, in Ohio. Look at these stats. You're talking Division about the go-to, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's before the end of the day. Whoa, whoa, let's go back. Thankfully, I got stats up there. Let's all relax. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so when they recruited me, they actually recruited me for football and basketball, mm. and they recruited me. Positions in both. And uh, football, I was defensive back and wide receiver. And basketball, I was a, a really a combo guard. I played point guard in high school, but college, I was kind of like a combo guard. Gotcha. Um, and so when they recruited me, I stayed with some cappers while they were pledging, oh, yeah. actually. So I kind of was hanging with them and saw what they were going through. And so, you know, when I got there, I pledged my freshman year. But, but I came from a good family. Mm-hmm. You know, my family, my parents have been married now. It's 1965, so almost 54 years, 53 years, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I never was involved with drugs, no gangbanger. You know, I think of uh, the truth song. I ain't got no (laughs) horror story, you know. But I wasn't, I mean, I was involved in some sin, but not like, you know how dudes embellish their testimony. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just shooting cats, yeah, yeah, man. Like, yo, you just look at me funny. I was like knocking you out. You know, yeah, 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 none yeah. of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? oh, man. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so my, I was, you know, my sophomore year, I started dating a woman who was a born again Christian. Mm. And everybody knew on campus she was a Christian because she, she was two years older than me. She had, gotten saved on campus and stopped doing, you know, a lot of things college students do. And uh, she was really the first person that I was close to that exposed me to biblical Christianity. Wow. You know, now that I look back, I had a couple of teammates who were Christians 
But I, re- I, I got to be honest, I ain't understand it at all. Mm-hmm. I just knew, like, one, one was, we were cool, but he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't go to parties with us. He wouldn't, he wasn't really on girls, women yeah. like that, and he wasn't getting drunk. And I just didn't know, understand why he wasn't doing stuff like that. I knew he, you know, was into the Bible kind of. Um, he would pray when we, you know, before a game, we all pray. He would lead the prayer. But I, 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 I that's how far away I was from biblical Christianity. Like, I, I couldn't even, ha- I didn't really even have a good concept of what mm. it was and how it would affect your lifestyle. And uh, so I started dating her, this woman. And, you know, we would pray. She would want to pray, so we'd pray together. And when she would pray, it sounded like she knew who she was talking to. Mm. Like, she knew it's always a woman this is a father. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah. This, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she was, like, she was praying to a friend, you mm. know, a father, somebody she had a relationship with. Whereas I, all I could pray were just memorized prayers. Mm. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be You know, just all this stuff that I just memorized. And so uh, that intrigued me. I was like, man, she sounds like she know who she's talking to, whereas I'm just reciting stuff I was taught, you know? And then we would, you know, I, I would go to Bible study with her and, you know, um, sit there. And, and my boy who played ball, he would lead the Bible studies and stuff. So I was in there. So I was being exposed. Shoot, I even fasted one day with the the, oh, wow. the Christians on campus. They, did, <laughs> they had this little group and they were fasting one day. So I fasted, you know? And, um, so over time, you know, I, I went to church with her a few times, not, mm-hmm. not a ton, because on campus, there really wasn't a church that she went to. But she graduated, went to medical school in, in Cleveland, Ohio, which was a, close to an hour away. And uh, so I went to church with her a few times. So after we had been dating about a year and a half, I, uh, we went to a church, and it was a charismatic church, and... I'd never seen anything like that. You know, like there was the lyrics were on the wall and everybody was singing and excited and praising and people were happy. And I never, church for me was just counting down the minutes till it was over. I mean, really just sitting there like bored, stiff, daydreaming and all that. And uh, she, you know, so that was, there was the minister was a guest minister and he was talking about his testimony about how he was a teenager and he was on drugs and he gave his life to, he ran away from home and then gave his life to Christ and his whole life changed and, you know, obviously he became a minister and, you know, straightened his life out. And for some reason, his message or and maybe just the presence of God that was there convicted me. And that was the first time that I really in my life felt like, man, I ain't right with God. Cause I was I was cheating on my girlfriend. I was involved in premarital sex. I was trying dragging her down in different things. And um, you know, I knew I was like, I- I'm not right with God, you know? And I felt like like if I died, I knew I would go to hell, deservedly so. Cause I was just, I knew the Ten Commandments and how generally how he asked us to live. And I was just willfully walking away from that, doing my thing. I was my own Lord. Mm. And so when the pastor gave his altar call, you know, I I was standing there. I was, I felt like everybody in that church was looking at me like, you, you know, you need to go down there and get saved. And uh, I was literally praying that he didn't come down and get me, Mm. you know, and um, he didn't. So I didn't go down and give my life to Christ. Um, I went back to school because I was visiting her over the weekend. So I went back to school, but I knew I needed to get saved. Uh, but I was running from the Lord. You know, I was, uh, I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to repent. You know, that's the first step to salvation is repentance. I knew I didn't have to be perfect, but I didn't even want to try to live a godly life. And so I was running from God. I got a little bit worse doing all types of stuff up at school. And uh, that summer, God still blessed me. Got had a summer internship. It was after my junior year. Had a summer internship at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which was the biggest newspaper in Ohio at the time. And I did well in that. And so a few weeks before it was over, they told me that they were going to hire me when I graduated a year later. So you can imagine as a going into your senior year of college, knowing you got a job waiting for you, a good job, job in sports writing that's fun, 
You know, I was like on top of the world, mm -hmm. you know. And so that lasted for a few days. And then I began to kind of think like, because I was raised like maybe like a lot of Americans to get the American dream. Like that was what life was about. Get the American dream. Go to school, do well in school so you can go to a good college, go to a good college so you can get a good job. You know, that was what life was about. So now that I kind of had that within my grasp, like, okay, I, I, I got that. I got this. I wasn't rich or anything, but I've got the American dream. I started feeling like, is this what life is about? Is this all there is to it? You know, like, there's got to be more to this than this. And when you have much of what life can offer and you still don't have any peace, then that, that can be scary, yeah. you know? And I knew it was God. I knew because I was running from God, you know, but I didn't want to, I was like, man, I ain't, shoot. I ain't know how any dudes that I hung with that was living for the Lord. Mm. I knew dudes that went to church, but as far as really trying to walk with Christ, I was like, I ain't about to be the only one. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> Frat brothers, all that. I was like, heck, you know. And so I was running from God. And so... I remember being in Catholic church with my girlfriend, my parents, and I was sitting there and I was miserable, you know, and I was like, man, I ain't got no peace and joy. And I'm, I'm talking to God in my own way. And I'm like, God, I know I got to give my life to you, you know? And I'm like, just give me my first semester, senior year. And then in January, I'll get saved. Mm. Yeah. I, I want to borrow <laughs> my first semester. Because I was like, I'm going to be 21 years old, about time to become an adult. I'll be ready to get saved then. But no, give me my first though. semester. Let me do whatever I want to do. Girls getting drunk, partying, you know, all that. And that was my plan. And in my mind, God was like, all right, cool. <laughs> like, now, I, know, I know he wasn't saying that, but that's what I was thinking he was saying. Because the Bible says tomorrow's not promised, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I went back to school, started getting involved, just doing stuff. Try, you know, and it wasn't really feeling right, wasn't really in me no more. Wasn't, you know, I was like, man, why am I doing this? Like, and But I kept looking for loopholes. I remember watching a movie about Elvis Presley. And I was like, man, Elvis, he had everything. Such all the money story, in the world, man. all the women, all the fame, like everything you could want as a man and dude was miserable mm -hmm. and was a drug addict and overdose. That was part of his death. Mm -hmm. uh, read a story about, about Bobby Brown, who was hot at that yeah. time. Y'all young. Yeah, we are young. But he was hot. Yeah. He was like, <laughs> he had a hit album, Tenderoni, uh, mm -hmm. My Prerogative, Don't all know. that stuff. <laughs> he was the man. Don't be cruel. And I remember reading, I remember it saying, the article, he was happier when he was poor. He said, I was happier when I was poor because of all the problems money's brought. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, these dudes ha got everything and they still don't have peace. They still miserable. So I, my 21st birthday, my parents were going to take me and my girlfriend out. And so we went out to dinner. Before we went out to dinner, my father and I were running errands. And so I asked him, I said, I said, Daddy, I said, what keeps you going in life? I said, once you got the good job, you have two boys, both in college doing well. You got a nice house. Like, what, what, once you get all that, what keeps you going? And he was like, well, you know, you want to make more money. You want to get a bigger house. You want to get a nicer car. You want to, you know, get more money. You can help other people. Like, everything he said was fine. It was good. But I was just like, none of that's going to fill this void that's in my heart, you know? And so finally... Basically, for me, it was like God just broke me down mm. to the point where it was either you give your life to Christ and get some peace and some joy, or you keep running and you be miserable. Mm. And so my 21st birthday, that, you know how usually people make a wish over the, you blow out the candles. I, I prayed, instead of making a wish, I prayed at that moment over my cake and in my, in my, to myself and repented of my sins and accept, asked Jesus Christ to become my personal Lord and Savior. What day was that? October 28th, 1989. I was, I knew you were born in October. Yeah, really? I was born really? October 22nd, 1990. Oh, wow. Oh, mm. you wasn't even born yet. <laughs> I was not born yet. I was, I was not, no. <laughs> so, uh, so that's it. That's when my, my natural birthday is my spiritual birthday. Wow. So now it's been almost 29, 
almost 30 years. I've oh, been wow. saved 29 years. So more most of my life now I've been saved. And I got to be honest, I can't imagine not being saved. Like, I guess I'd survive, you know, and maybe be doing well or whatever. But um, spiritually, emotionally, you know, my security, uh, the peace, the joy that I have, I can't imagine living without Christ. So that's my testimony, man. That was a good one. That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. Lord. I, I, for me, it was a big, like, from what I noticed, it's really comforting, like, comforting hearing this because I was just like that in college as well. Like, especially like, when I first heard it, like, you know, all your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And I'm just right. like, whoa. <laughs> like, right, all right. the good things I've been doing, you know, the good, you know, the good personality, the good D's, the good guy image, all that right. thing I had meant nothing, you know, comparing myself to my friends and right, all right. those things. I was just like, man, I don't drink, I don't smoke, but everything. I should be good. <laughs> right, right, right. God, I'm right. good. <laughs> and like, it, just knocked, it just knocked me off my pedestal. And it really, like, because I never heard that growing up. I, like, mm. I, did you grow uh, up in church? I did grow up in okay. church. I grew up uh, going to Lakewood Church, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so sin wasn't really something that I just really heard about a lot. Right. Um, and especially, I just always compared, you know, and no one's like, man, I can just keep this sin and everything else, I, I'm good at it. Yep. I'm good. Uh, so when I heard that, it really rocked my world as well. And I kind of ran from it, uh, really tried to deny it, really tried to, you know, not convert. Um, but like you said, it was something where it's like, man, I know I'm doing something not right. Right. Uh, right. The void is not there. Um, I'm always sad about whatever. Um, so like, I understood it. Like you said, it's just comfy, comforting hearing that from you. Well, you, that's a good point because a lot of the people that are the hardest to bring to Christ are those that are good. Yeah. People, because they do compare themselves to others. Yeah. I'm not a, a murderer. I'm not a Drug rapist. addict or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but God's not comparing you to other people. Mm -hmm. He's comparing you to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was sinless, you know? <laughs> so, like, how how you going to get into a heaven that has no sin when you got sin? No matter how good you're, that's why Jesus came and said, look, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, mm. you committed adultery. Like, if you just hate your brother, you committed murder. So who's the, you might be a person that lives a clean life, but he was showing you that's how much, that's what sin is. Everybody's done something. Everybody's looked at a woman the wrong, you know what I mean? Or or thought about hurting somebody in a way. He said, that's that's all it takes. Mm. It don't take, you don't have to go out there and actually cheat physically on your wife. Mm. If you're just thinking about that sin, that shows you everybody needs the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I actually think what we're seeing, what God is showing America today, because look at America, mm -hmm. the politicians, how much corruption are we seeing in politics? The president, mm -hmm. how much corruption are we seeing in the president? Uh, our athletes, how much corruption are we seeing in our athletes? Our entertainers, the Me Too movement. You see in pillars, pillars of society. Nobody was a bigger pillar in society than Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. And he is crumbling down. Like all the God is showing us, this is who you are. This is who you are. Everybody needs. It's like that scripture coming to life. There is none righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just showing you, you all need me. Mm -hmm. You need to be forgiven and cleansed from your sins. And so hopefully people will see it. I don't think people are seeing it, but that's really what we're being shown. Because think you people are losing faith in all the institutions. Mm -hmm. To all the way up to the president. Now, before our current president, you always had, there was a professionalism, a diplomacy. It, even though stuff was going on behind the scenes, it was like there was this facade that everything's clean. and you know, Now that's taken away. So people don't even have faith now in the highest office in the land. You know? And so we need faith in God because we can't put them in our institutions anymore. Man, that's a really good point. And like most the of the church too. Oh, yeah. You see yeah, in yeah. a lot of church can not that's not necessarily new, but you see in all these church scandals too. Yeah. And so uh yeah, man. No, and 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 the point about the church is you just mm -hmm. it's so funny because a lot of the pastors 
like I became a Christian when I was 19 years old in college as well. Yep. A very similar story because my st- most people find God at the bottom. Right. I found him at the top. That's <laughs> you great. know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's, so like, that's, that's great, man. And that's a different experience right. because it's like, because for, for so many people, like you said, sometimes the problem is like, when I need God, I ask for him. And when I don't need God, I don't ask right, for him. Right. But it's like, when you have everything that you need and you're still asking for him, like that mindset puts you in a different framework because throughout every season of your life, you remember that even at the mountaintop, you know, I'm right. still not satisfied. Mm. But, one thing, being an athlete, I know it, Chris knows it, and obviously you're with athletes 24-7, you know, a lot of men are so hesitant from church and from God. Like, a lot of men, unfortunately, especially in the black community, you see, like, the average, you know, predominantly black church is about, you know, some argue with 70 to 80 percent right, women. Right, um, right. And then, you know, you have kids— Boys there from zero to eighteen, and then men there after they get married from thirty five right. plus. Right. You know, but yeah. then like the, the eighteen to thirty five age group, a lot of guys aren't there. I.e., your king movement comes in, and you're trying to help get a lot of young men. What do you think is one of the biggest hurdles that's preventing a lot of young men from being a part of the church? You know, committing to Christ and stuff like that. Wow, I mean, there's so much to unpack with that. But one, I think. The church, specifically the black church, has been effeminized. Mm. You know, obviously the pastor's been a man in most yeah. cases, but like you said, the congregation is seventy to eighty percent female, and the preaching in in many cases, I love great preaching. But sometimes it's geared toward just getting you emotional exactly. and getting you hyped. Right? Yeah, 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 I've yeah. sat in services and the the preacher, with all due respect. Ain't really saying nothing. I'm telling you. And people yelling and screaming, <laughs> and, and he ain't right. And he ain't even. Right. I've preached at churches where every sentence, Amen. people were like, I was thinking, right, I up? mean, and I believe I deliver a good message, but there were sentences I were saying where I didn't really say much. You know, yeah. I just say something, and they like, yeah. And I'm like, so there's some of that. Um, and Christ, like I said, that that Christianity has been effeminized in America or in, in the black church. And that's one thing that keeps, you know, a lot of men from it. You look at well, a big part of my testimony too, this is post coming to Christ, but still in my growth was that my brother, when I got saved, I witnessed to my brother and he was a uh, year behind me, but he went to Howard University, HBCU in Washington, D.C. And when I witnessed to him, he initially was receiving what I was saying but then he, uh, he, the Nation of Islam was getting pretty big at that time under Louis Farrakhan. And they were obviously making a real strong push at Howard. So he started going to some of their meetings and he eventually joined the Nation of Islam. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, one thing we used to debate back and forth. And one thing he finally said to me one day, he said, man, the reason I became a Muslim was because the men I see in the mosque looked more like the men in, I read about in the Bible than the men I saw in church, mm. you know? And um, I remember myself, because again, I didn't have much Bible knowledge. And I had been, I went to visit him spring break my senior year. And uh, so I had been saved for a few months, you know, maybe four or five months. And uh, we were going to, he was taking me to books. So I went to one of the Nation of Islam's power studies, they called them, and they're teaching and, we were going to bookstores and I was seeing all these books about, you know, the Bible's tampered with and, and mm-hmm. this and that. And I did, again, I didn't know much, you know, and I remember I was sitting in his apartment. And he was in class and I was eating breakfast and I had the Bible right here and I had the Quran right here. They were both in front of me and I was just reading through them, looking at, skimming them, looking at different parts. And I saw in the Quran where it said Jesus wasn't the son of God. And obviously the Bible says he is. So I was like, okay, both of these aren't from God. There's no way they both from God. You know, because again, I wasn't coming at it from some, oh, I've been churched. You know, I hadn't been churched, so to speak. And so I'm like, all right, one of these ain't from God. And I I went into his room and I just started praying. And I was like, God, look, I just want to serve you. I just want to live for you. If that's being a Muslim, then fine. If that's being a Christian, this guy's a saint, right? Then fine. Here. If that's being whatever. I'm, I'm, I just want to serve you. And I remember at that moment, like, I just felt this strong presence 
mm. of Jesus, mm. Jesus, Jesus, mm. Jesus, Jesus. And from that moment on, I was like, man, I'm with Jesus, mm. like no matter what. And that's everybody has to have that that type of faith mm -hmm. where no matter if the pastor goes against him, if my parents go against him, if my wife goes against him, I know what I had with Jesus. I know what I experienced with him and I'll never leave. You know what I'm saying? And so that was a big, but my, the, the nation of Islam conversely, it's not nearly as strong now as it used to be, but there, whereas the black church might be one, one man to four women, they are four men to men to one woman, mm. four men to one woman, and so it's because they do present their message in a more masculine way, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually biblical. What what we have going on in church, and it's not just the black. It's the black church is the greatest example yeah. of it and the greatest extreme. But white churches as well, you're seeing it's more female. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not biblical yeah. at all. Like when you look in the Bible, there's no dearth of men. Mm. Women are strong. You know, Mary Magdalene, you know, one of the first to see Jesus. And, you know, there's women play a role. But men, there's no lack of strong men of God. There's no, you know, Jesus isn't struggling to get people to follow him. There's no lack of biblical prophets in the Old Testament. You know what I mean? So we're doing something wrong. And so we need to present Christianity in a truly biblical way, mm. not just forcing it, trying to force it to be masculine, but make it biblical. Mm. I love what Justin Gibney, he uh, from Ann, the Ann campaign. Mm. One thing he said when we he posted on one of my posts about the King movement, he said, "Look, we're not uh, we don't we don't want toxic masculinity, and we don't want effeminization." Of men, because that's really what the world is now going to all the way to the other extreme and trying to feminize men. Uh, we want biblical men or men to be like Jesus. Mm. Jesus had the typical male toughness. Mm. He was a carpenter. When he had to, he rolled up in the temple yep. with a whip and ran dudes out. Even tables and whatnot. Right. He 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 got into a, a heated argument. He calling people out. You know what I mean? Like he had that typical male that you want but he also had compassion he wept you know he 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 was distraught about the future that he knew had jerusalem had coming to it mm. you know like so he he would hug men you know the one of the apostles laid on his breast like he was compassionate so that that's that's really what you want you want a man but you also want a man that's not afraid to show his emotions and be compassionate and loving and kind and stuff too. So uh, we have to exemplify biblical Christianity. Mm. Uh, and America has never seen biblical Christianity. What America's really seen is white supremacy with sprinklings of Christianity on it. Mm. That's what American Christianity has been. We That's undeniable mm. unless you think that the enslavement of people for the color of their skin is biblical, mm. <laughs> which yeah. is not. Yeah. So uh, people can get mad all they want. That's what we've had in America. America was founded on white supremacy that was sprinkled with little elements of Christianity on it to make it seem good. But we haven't seen biblical Christianity. If we had seen biblical Christianity in America, we wouldn't have needed a Frederick Douglass, a Harriet Tubman, a Martin Luther King, or any of that. You know, And so we wouldn't have the problems we have today. And I think America would be in a much better place if it has seen biblical Christianity, whites and blacks and people of other races together as one people for Christ. And when they see that, remember Jesus said in John 17, 21, he prayed for future believers. He said, I pray that they are one because when they are one, like the father and the son are one, that's when the world will believe you sent me or you sent Jesus. So when the world sees biblical Christianity, then they'll start to believe Jesus is real. But they're not seeing it. And that's one reason our country is headed in the direction it is. Now, that's a really good point. And the point about healthy masculinity is a, mm. is a huge one because what you literally described is like most people don't understand the kind of the dynamic range of Christ being the lion mm -hmm. of Judah, 
But then the lamb right. of God, like you said, that tough and that tenor, that's what men are. So what ends up happening is people either want one or the other, you know, right. and they can't understand this, like kind of this antinomy of these two seemingly paradoxical ideas coexisting as one. But that's true masculinity, because like you said, if you take away the lion, then he's just a lamb who's a, in essence a pushover, right. essence just has no which backbone. is what a lot of people, want to God is, is love, so I can do whatever, yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. And then that part of masculinity right. is really unhealthy. So some people would argue that, you know, in slavery, it wasn't just toxic masculinity, it was also passive masculinity because mm-hmm. there's a lot of men who knew it was wrong, who did nothing, who mm-hmm. said nothing, you know, who right. just passively no just question. let people, you know, would rape and own other human beings. So there's passive masculinity in there. And obviously we know the other the other half. And it's so fascinating that you brought up that mm-hmm. the church isn't really teaching healthy, like, like teaching effeminate messages and not really balanced messages because there's this book called on why men hate going to church. It's a great book. And in the book, it has this, like these two charts where it says here are male values. Well, it says it has two lists of values and it says value A and value B. And it asks you which value is more Christian. And almost everybody goes to value A and I, I wish I had it up. And, and, Everyone goes to values A. And what's interesting is that the chart came from a book called uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, mm-hmm. a popular book back right, in the day. Right. And all A was Venus women values, and then B was male values. But it's fascinating. But and they said A, the feminine ones were more Christian. They said wow. literally 95% of people in surveys picked A. Wow. Mm-hmm. The feminine ones. And it's fascinating because a lot of stuff that we consider unhealthy is biblical. Like, for example, like one of the things in value B was like power. People are, oh, power, that's unhealthy. No, God said the Holy Spirit will give you power. Exactly. You know I mean? exactly. So there's a lot of stuff, right. you know, like, and then another thing was like competency. And it's like, no, like, if you don't work, you don't eat. Like the biblical mandate of the Protestant work ethic of working right. hard and doing your job, to, uh, Colossians 3.23, working to God and not right. to man. Mm-hmm. Like competency is a part of biblical right. health. So there's all these ideas that you're communicating that, isn't being taught. And when men don't see it, men feel like there's no place for me here. Exactly. And like, so seeing men like you, is why I wanted you on the show, which you, you said inspiration to me was seeing men like you be exemplary uh, examples of healthy masculinity encourages other men to want to desire that as well. Amen. No, I, I agree with everything you said and uh, thank you for that compliment. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's got to, it's got to change. You know, we got to represent the Lord uh, properly, and if we do that, I think we can get we'll get men into the church. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm it's an interesting situation, interesting topic, you know. Yeah, and then so, <laughs> yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead. I mean, so like going down that road, like, what are the, some of the three top three things that you learn from like teaching these young men that are stopping them from giving their life to Christ? Um, if I had to pick three things, one, one is just, you know, people don't want to repent. Some people just want to, they want to live in sin. They want to sin, you know? So that, that's one thing that is universal across all races Mm -hmm. and genders and all that. Uh, another thing for black men, there is this myth in the black community. I'm sure you guys have heard of it that Christianity is a white man's religion. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that black men don't want religion because black black people in America, and I I would even argue worldwide, uh, but certainly in America, of the American population are the most religious people people in the country. People are super spiritual. My family's from Nigeria. You go to Africa, Africa's super spiritual. Right, right. Christian or Muslim or, you know, an an African religion. Like, no question about it. And so... um, they're like you look at the Hebrew black Hebrew Israelites they got a lot of men probably similar to the nation of Islam where they have more men than women the nation of Islam they have a lot of men orthodox Islam you know you see blacks in in those religions so it's not that black men don't want religion uh, it's just that they don't want this weak watered down version of Christianity that they've seen from white people 
and also seen at times in the black church. You know, black church has done a, a lot for black people, more than any other organization by far, mm. you know, but it's also been a lot of weaknesses there. But it's not even, if you talk to black men, whether it's in prison, in the corporate boardroom, on the streets, wherever, it's not that they have a problem with Jesus. They, they will love Jesus. And they don't have a problem with the doctrine of grace. Mm. Because a lot of dudes whose religion don't even bring grace, yeah, they, don't bring they talk about grace. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the Nation of Islam doctrine, it's really a mixture of Islam and Christianity and mm -hmm. other black nationalism. Like they throw in stuff that's Christian, yeah. you know? And we all want grace. We all know we need grace. Yeah. Anybody that admits they're a sinner, you know you need grace. And when they get in trouble, they admit, I'm a sinner like everybody else. I'm not perfect or by the grace of God or what. That's a Christian doctrine. Yeah. So the problem for black men is not with Jesus, the biblical Jesus. It's not with the doctrine of grace or what Christianity is. It is with the notion, every, look, for black people, let's just keep it real. In America, white people control virtually every aspect of our lives. I'm not talking about the personal interactions you might have with your wife. They control the economic system that we have to find a way to function under. No matter how militant, no matter how Afrocentric you are, you have to find a way to function in this economic system that is built by white people. The money has white presidents on it. It's so the economic system is all set up by, by whites. So we have to figure out how do we get money and survive in this system. So they control the economic system. They control the educational system that we're up under. They control the criminal justice system that we're up under. So every one of those aspects of our lives, they control. Those are the key aspects of your life outside of your interpersonal relationship. And those three areas impact your interpersonal relationship. If you don't have money, it's going to affect your relationship with your wife. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have an education, it's going to affect your ability to get a wife or, you know. And so they control every aspect. What black men, spirituality, we all know this, Christian or not, we all know spirituality is between me and God. It's personal. And that's biblical because the Bible says in Timothy there's only, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. So God wants you, he doesn't want your spirituality to be based on another person. He wants it to be based on Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. on your personal relationship with Christ. So what black men are saying is like, whites just control every aspect of our lives. The one area I will not give them is my spirituality. I will not give them my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And many black men feel like this is a misconception, but they believe it, that for me to get to God, the Christian, be a Christian, the mediator is not Jesus, it's white people. Mm -hmm. Like I got to get up under white people and learn from them. And they tell me about God and they tell me what, what's right and what's wrong. And they tell me about Jesus. And they don't want that. Now, when that's, but that's not biblical. Like I said, what's biblical is your mediator is Jesus. And you have the Bible for yourself. You have the Holy Spirit. He can teach you. I'm not saying it's wrong to get training, but I'll tell you this, because I looked into going to seminary. Mm. And I looked into going to Dallas. I, I was accepted to Dallas Theological Seminary, Gordon Conwell, uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. I was going to go to Fuller, Westminster in Philadelphia, and uh, Alliance up in Nyack. I was going to go to either Fuller at one point, then later, years later, I was going to go to Alliance. But I was going to go in there knowing these seminaries are stained by white supremacist thinking. Hmm. Now, so I got to decipher what's really biblical and what's really white supremacist teaching, you know? And, and so, because I studied a lot of black and African history and African Christian history. Hmm. And so I was going in there knowing that and so black men, if we can get them to understand when you become a Christian, the mediator is Jesus. Mm. It's you and Jesus. You know, it's not white people in between you and God. And you can remove that myth. Then they can look at the doctrine of grace for what it really is. Then they can 
look, and then they got to decide. We want to remove that myth that it's the white man's religion, that the white man's a mediator. And then you got to decide as a man, black, white, otherwise, am I willing to repent for my sins and receive the grace of God? So that's that's really something that has to be done. No, no, that and that's really good. And so just for some of our some of our listeners, I think just for clarification, I think just so people don't misunderstand what we're trying to communicate. Like we're not saying that because a white person's teaching Christianity is somehow tainted. We're not saying that the ethnic background is somehow tainted, but there is a culture of assimilation that occurs in which somehow that Western Christianity is more Western values than Christian values. And Western, whether whether or not you you think Western values are good or bad, end of the day, that's syncretism. That's not right. just true Christian theology. There's a mixture of Western values and Christian values. So when you when you teach somebody in regards to being a part of any community of faith and and they have to assimilate to a certain to culture, your culture that's right. the problem so right. that's what that's what a right. lot of people is it's not that people don't want to be christian they don't want to be of a culture they want to lose they don't my feel cult- like they have to I have to so give up my ethnicity exactly or my blackness to be a christian exactly you you said you're nigerian yes, sir. okay in africa when historically when Christians were baptized, when Africans were baptized by the Christian missionaries in many of the countries, they would give them a Christian name, yep. first name. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a Christian name. It was a European name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of Africans who have a European first name and an African last name. Yeah. <laughs> Nelson Mandela, mm-hmm. Desmond Tutu. Yeah. You know, like Desmond is not any more Christian than the name Mohammed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A name is a name. Yeah. If you want to say a biblical name or something, that's one thing. But uh, European names are not Christian names, but that's an exact example yeah. of what you're talking about. And not just that. Another good example is that if you go to like Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, where its temperatures are ridiculously hot, pastors preach in suits. You know, you got to think about that. Why are you preaching in a suit in sub-Saharan Africa when it's over a hundred and something degrees? Because they teach you that in order to preach this message, you must look like this. You must mm-hmm. wear what we wore mm-hmm. when we came to you. So like you said, there's so much. So what we're talking about is that that's what limits people. Mm-hmm. And if you can remove that cultural assimilation and remove that unhealthy ideologies that communicate that somehow to be, of, it's kind of like in, um, and we're going to a theological rabbit, tor- rabbit trail, but <laughs> like in the book of Acts with the Judaizers, where they were preaching that in order for you to be Christian, you have to become Jewish first. Mm. And that was one of the biggest issues because all, all right. the men were like, yo, I'm not going to get circumcised. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? So right. that was a stumbling block in essence to the gospel. And so what you end up seeing is that Paul rebuked that. And it was in the book of Gal- all that's what the book of Galatians is all about, mm-hmm. rebuking the Judaizers right. saying that no, like it's only Christ, you know? Right. There 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 is no Christ plus circumcision. So what ends up happening in a lot of people is that theologically it's Christ is Jesus plus western culture, right. Jesus plus right. this and then people not so much being deterred by Jesus, they're deterred by the stumbling block of what you're adding to Jesus, and that limits people from giving themselves to God. So I wanted to clarify that nah, in case anybody yeah. wasn't. I'll was give you sure. an example. I, I sat in on one of the classes at Alliance Theological Seminary, and it was the first week of classes. So he, the professor was handing out the syllabus and everything. The class was the history of the Christian church. And when I looked at the syllabus, in reality, it was the history of the European Christian church. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They didn't teach. They did. There was no mention of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church or the Greek Orthodox Church. And Ethiopia church. is the oldest Christian nation in the world, mm-hmm. before Armenia and before Rome. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they didn't even mention the Greek Orthodox Church, mm-hmm. not the Indian Orthodox Church, not the Egyptian Coptic Church. It talked of as much as Protestants may be against Catholicism. Mm-hmm. If you go to a typical Protestant seminary and study the history of the church, for the first 1400 years or so are going to be about Catholicism Mm -hmm. and then the Reformation. You might get the radical Reformation added to that, but you not, you're not going to learn about the true history of Christianity because you're not going to learn about the non white cultures that also were Christian. Mm. And so we need to, uh, that's the one thing that needs to be taught is the true history of Christianity uh, the the multiculturalism in the Bible, 
Uh, so people don't associate Jesus and Christianity with Western culture, yeah. but they just associate it with Jesus. Yeah. And uh, now there's no doubt America was based on a Judeo-Christian, I say a, a Judeo-Christian worldview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it was certainly not a Christian nation in the way it treated people of color. That's, that's a good point. And that's, and that's just something that, you know, especially in the world of sports, you know, so like that's what bothers me. You know, so many athletes, so many young men, they, they're like in a, in a Gandhi-esque kind of way. I, I, I like your Christ. I just don't like your Christians because your Christians communicate this message of unhealth and they perpetuate hypocrisy. Another thing I think I would add to your point, what prevents a lot of young men, a lot of men is hypocrisy. Right. I have no somebody, somebody in my family who, you know, I can't say this person's name because they get mad at me, but one of the main, they went to like a Christian school growing up and all that stuff, and they're Muslim. You know, I'm the only Christian with my last name. Um, so, well, sorry, only Christian male besides me and my brother, only two Christian males with my last in, name. In your family. In my entire family. So your family was a Muslim yeah, family. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they said that their, their number one issue was that he would go to mosque he would go to church and they were the exact same people and then to make it worse he would go to the street and they were all the same you mean just the way morally, they acted morally right, right, right. Was, yeah, for clarification morally and he was like the the the, the, the and the worst thing about it and i don't know i don't want to spend too much time but, but the worst thing about it was he was saying that like when people go to some parts of africa there's a lot of light-skinned people there a lot of light-skinned light people skinned black people yeah or a white, lot of okay. them and he's like how did they come about because the only white guys that were there were priests. <laughs> were the missionaries, right? You know? <laughs> right, right, So right, they didn't right, marry right. these women. Right. So, like, there's so much hypocrisy right. there. And he just saw it all. And that just created a huge stumbling block. And so that's why, you know, I take, I'm not perfect, you know. Right, <laughs> we right, all know right, I'm not right, perfect. Right. But I take, like, uh, being above reproach is a big thing. And that's why I, I love your life because you're just a man who resembles that. Obviously, you're not perfect either. Right. But because for so many people, when they, the moment they see, somebody do something not to sin but in live in like a lifestyle hypocrisy right. they demonize christianity no that's a great point and and that's in in our individual experiences when mm -hmm. like you said if an individual who claims to be a christian has harmed you or you just see their lifestyle is hypocritical or it could be your parents mm -hmm. like one thing i think about you know obviously i've raised my daughters to be christians and been telling them about Jesus their whole life, going to church, having Bible study, praying with them the whole nine yards. If I was to cheat on my wife or beat up my wife or some, something like that, like what that would do to their faith. I mean, ultimately, you got to have your own faith. Yeah. But that would be such a stumbling block for them to see. You've been telling us about Jesus all our lives and how we should live all our lives. And you cheating on mommy? Mm. Like so that that's real and you have to you know we we should think about that cuz we are rep that's why that scripture you brought up earlier uh Colossians where it talks about or second Corinthians or, or no Colossians 3 where it talks about whatever you do in word or deed do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you know so whatever we represent ourselves if I if I was endorsed by Nike LeBron James endorsed by Nike Everything he does, if it's something that's really off and misrepresents Nike, they're going to have something to say about it. Mm -hmm. We should be the same way. When we, we know everywhere we go, everything we do, we're representing Christ. And I think also to your point about the African history, yeah, a lot of black people and white people are looking at American history. That's why when, when, when white Christians or white evangelicals want to say, America's, we got to go back to the way it was. America was such this great Christian nation. You're actually putting a stumbling block in front of not only people of color, but white liberals who have all, who have studied more of a true American history mm. than white conservatives have. I think white Christians, I'm making a generalization, mm -hmm. but they're... <laughs> They've really studied maybe the the most false American history of all American citizens because mm. they don't know they they just think it was this pristine we were this great Christian nation everybody was living for Christ and all that mm. there was this little blind spot called slavery but no they think that 
And so when you associate America's past, slavery, Jim Crow, all that, with Christ or with Christianity, you're putting a stumbling block in front of people. And they like, if that's Christianity, I don't want it. Frederick Douglass, one of my heroes, he said, I, he was a Christian. He said, there, I find the greatest divide between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of America. Mm. He said, it's so far, they're so far apart that to love one is of necessity to hate the other. Mm. So if you love American Christianity, what it, especially what it used to be, you got to hate the real, and that's true. Because the Christianity of Christ is what? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's that simple. Mm. We don't have to get deep theologically. It's that simple. Do unto others as you had them do unto you. Would you want somebody to enslave you because of the color of your skin? It's that simple. Would you want somebody to discriminate against you, rape your wife, all the stuff that went with slavery because of the color of your skin? No, of course not. So that's it. So it's, and like you said, we're not, I'm not bashing, you know, whites or white Christians or anything. You know, I'm trying to say we have to really represent Christ, black Christians and white Christians. You know, we've talked about, you know, some of the problems with the black church, you know. So it's not just whites, but, you know, we do have to talk about the truth, you know, That's if we so really true. want to represent the Lord. Mm, mm, mm. Man. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm I'm like, so one of the things that you... You recently that you brought up that you know want to respect for your time, but I wanted to ask you was that you say you've been married for twenty three years? Okay, I don't want to cut you short. Yeah, it'd be, be twenty four in June. Okay, yeah. so um, I, I got two fun directions. Go ahead, boy. First Let's one, yeah. So you have two daughters who are twenty one. A lot of young women, especially women of color, they feel as though I'm not sure if you heard this from your daughters, but they feel as though there's not a lot of good black men who are out there available, who are God-fearing and all that kind of stuff. Like, have you have you heard that? Like, have your daughters ever communicated that to you or said anything like that along that line? I have not heard that from them. Obviously, I've heard it. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. I, I've thought, I haven't thought that it, it's not so much good black men. It's, it's black men, period. Mm. I mean, when you, and when you have daughters, you do think about that. Like, because when you subtract the black men who are in prison, and that's some systemic racism right there. Not that brothers haven't done things wrong, but we know mass incarceration and the drug war and the result that that's had on our community. But if you take away black men who have been in prison, take away, what, one out of three or four is supposed to be in some way, shape, or form tied to the criminal justice system. So you take those away. You take away black men who are living a gay lifestyle. You take away black men who are not college educated. Not that they have to be, but it's not so much, because I used to talk with sisters in college about, why, if the brother didn't go to college, he's a plumber, but he's a good dude, why can't you, just because you got went to college, why can't you date him or marry him or whatever? And then I realized through my own experiences that obviously... <laughs> philosophically, there shouldn't be anything against that. But sometimes your life experiences, like if you're a person that went to college, maybe you got a master's or you went to college and you work in corporate America, now all of a sudden some of your life experiences are very different from the brother that never went to college. So you may be willing mentally to marry someone who didn't go to college, but you've had such different experiences and your day-to-day -day now is totally different that it might, not doesn't have to be, but it could create a barrier and, a, and a, you know, an obstacle into you really falling in love. So when you subtract all of that, I hate to say it, but there feels like there's a, a dearth. I mean, the numbers just show it, mm -hmm. that there are so many more college-educated black women who are, you know, working in corporate jobs and, I mean, all, you know, PhDs, master's degrees, all, the whole nine yards, than black men on those levels that it's a big problem. And then you subtract black men who may marry outside of the race. So for, for black women, uh, my daughters have not had an issue, uh, but I, I, I hate to say it, man. It's a problem. Mm. It's a big problem. I feel, 
I, I feel in a lot of ways, I don't want to be a pity part like that, like they're pitiful, but I feel for sisters, man, mm-hmm. because they now the numbers say only 28%, I believe, of black women are expected to get married. 28? 28%. And we got to look at ourselves as black men. I'm not saying you can't marry outside of the race, you know, anything like that. But I do have a problem if you put women who are non-black, if you're black and you put non-black women on a pedestal, like if you think white women, Asian women, Hispanic women, Indian women, whatever, are better than black women, that's a problem. And I do have a problem with that. If you just fall in love with somebody, you think black women are as good as any other woman and you just happen to fall in love with somebody of another race, that's one thing. But when you don't want to date black women and you got a problem with black women or you black, you brown skin, and you don't want to date brown skin women, What's that saying about your psyche? What's that saying what you think when you look in the mirror? You know? And it's a lot of brothers with that mentality. So we have to look at ourselves. And we scream at white supremacy. We scream and we want to pull down white supremacy. We scream at Wakanda and all that. <laughs> but when you really get to the nitty gritty, it's a lot of white supremacist thinking in black America. It's a part of black American culture. Black American culture was birthed in the most dysfunctional situation imaginable, chattel slavery. Mm. So white supremacy is a literally a part of our culture, and we need to exercise that from black culture just as we're trying to exercise white supremacy from the greater American culture. When we say good hair, you, you bigging up white supremacy right there. Mm. When you say that, you are. Because what is good hair in the black community? It's hair that's closer to white people's hair. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when, you, when you say, I only date red bones, mm. I only like red bones, what are you saying? You, you want a light-skinned woman whose skin is closer to white people. You value white skin, light skin, more than you value dark skin. But you the first one to yell about white supremacy. There's mm. a light supremacy in the black community. I'm light-skinned, obviously. Hey, trust me, I can hate Right, we, yeah. we, we get yeah, it. Yeah, we get it, man. Right, I, and I'm my right daughters are like, so I ain't, I'm not against, obviously I'm not against light-skinned black people. Mm. But I'm just tired of the hypocrisy of us screaming up, uh, at white people all the time about white supremacy, but we got white supremacy rampant in our own communities. The hip-hop videos, what kind of women they want in the videos, light skin, straight hair, long, you know what I mean? Let's keep it real and let's exercise white supremacy from our culture and American culture. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Bars. Man. You said you had something else? Oh, yeah. And then the, the other thing I was going to ask you is in regards to being a high-profile man and being somebody as your career has been growing and as, you know, as you're, you know, people have been getting to know you more and, you know, you're becoming just really an expert in your field. Like, how do you, how's that balanced with marriage? You know, like being, cause I, cause that's one of the things is like a lot of guys are kind of like, they're, cause they, I guess they're concerned about, they're confused about like, how do you balance a healthy marriage with like being at the top of your career and stuff like that? Well, now you're talking about my career specifically just or just general, general just careers? General, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for me, and I think as a Christian, your values have to be God first, family second, career third. Mm. Like, I, I don't think you can switch, though. As a Christian, I don't see how you switch those. Now, obviously, your career is part of providing for your family and all that. But um, so I think I've one thing I've always tried to do is that is, is just keep, you know, my family life, try to make make time for my family, for my wife and my children. And in my career, it was challenging at times because of the travel. Mm. Like I travel all, I travel a lot. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it was just, I, but just always trying to keep, you know, your family first, your wife first. Um, and I think like anything for a Christian, if you try to, be led by the Holy Spirit and biblical values, then that's that's going to tell you to put your family above your career. Doesn't there is a time like Ecclesiastes talks about the time for everything. There's a time to work and work hard. And, and as we said, 
everything we do in the name of Christ. So when we work, we need to work hard. We need to be at our best. We need to, you know, give our employer, you know, 100%. But then there's a time to rest. There's a time to recline. There's a time to enjoy your family. And so uh, that's just something I've, that's the way I've tried to do it to um, not neglect, you know, my family. And family is just a blessing, man. It's such a it's such a blessing. And I think as you let Christ, your mind be renewed by Christ, you'll see that and you want to, you know, spend that time with your family. Uh, so, yeah, I just think you have to, as a Christian, just keep your values straight. And that's one thing, like, being a Christian, you know, you have to be careful not to uh, lose your spirituality or lose your faith when you become, maybe you become successful in mainstream America because mainstream America is not Christian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, a lot of things that are done, people may try to get you away from your faith, you know. And I think for African Americans, that's one thing we, we do have to recognize and, and even be conscious of as we seek to enter corporate America and mainstream America and the workforce, we can't, we should not lose our faith. You know, we can't lose our faith just to gain what the world gives. I mean, Jesus, it's one of the most, you know, well-known quotes. What, what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? And a lot of, a lot of people, not just black, but period, have lost their soul mm -hmm in seeking and gaining the American dream. We talked about with the Me Too movement. How many of those people lost their soul? Mm. You know, and uh, and now it, it it came back to bite them. You know? But uh, man, it's such a blessing to you. One of the biggest things that, like you pointed out, the, the biggest issue for a lot of people is they've never seen it before. Mm. You know, they've never seen, you know, especially young black men or just young men in general, they've never seen your healthy masculinity, they've never seen God-fearing men, they've never seen this. So what we love about this show is to be able to show a lot of these men and also show a lot of these women as well, you know, because I think, unfortunately, even though you're right, there is, an, in a sense, a uh, drought or a shortage yeah. of um, men in certain communities. I also believe that God is raising up, you know, yeah. healthy men around the world and letting women know that it is possible as well. So I just thank you so much for being the example, yes, to yes. being a role model, to coming here and sharing. I know we didn't get into the sports stuff, man. but sometimes in life you just got to go yeah. a little bit more with some depth. No and, doubt. Uh, I talk enough sports. So <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mind it. So where can they reach out to you if they want to contact you at? Uh, I can be contacted at, attacked at king at kingmovement.com. Uh, that's our website too, kingmovement.com. Uh, myself on Twitter, I'm at Chris underscore Broussard. Uh, Instagram is Chris Broussard 68. Yeah. And uh, yeah, follow me, you know. Um, and I do a radio show. My radio show is The I Couple on Fox Sports Radio, iHeartMedia. Yeah, right. <laughs> iHeartMedia. Don't even get me started on Rob. So, so brothers can check that out. And then, of course, Fox Sports 1, they can see me on TV. And, nice. uh, and, and it is good brothers out there. Yeah. But yeah. we got to go get more. Exactly. And get them out, out of, and, and out of the, uh, the clutches of, of the system. But um, this is a great opportunity for the church. There's, there's so many young brothers out there that need and are looking for a role model, a father figure, a manly figure. And especially now that what's man, manhood is being yeah. skewed and who knows what it is according to society, then they, if we can show them that, then they're going to, we can bring a lot of men to, to Christ. That's you know, awesome. A lot of boys and men to Christ. So thank you so much. So as I said at the beginning of the podcast, it's your boy Hafiz. Chris the star of the show, baby. And we are joined by the one and only. Chris Broussard, the star of the show, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and we are the roommates, guys. Make sure you reach out to Chris, guys. If you are in the Atlanta area, make sure you go ahead and check out yes, that yes. King Movement event. Hopefully the episode will be out before that event takes place. But if not, make sure you connect to the King Movement, guys. Connect to Chris. Thank you so much. Continue to comment, 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 share, like, subscribe on iTunes, podcast, all that good stuff. We're the roommates, and we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs>